Good evening. We have a quorum at 7, 6.30. We'll, we'll call the meeting to order. And first up for general information, Mr. Dwyer. Uh, I have Rebecca Malay. Maye, thank you. Maye. Oh, may I speak? Yes. yes. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, so I have prepared a little statement to read to you all tonight so that you get to know me a little bit and why I'm here. Um, forgive me if it's a little long, but... This is obviously an issue that is very important to me. So thank you for listening in advance. <clears throat> so my name is Rebecca Maye. I am the owner operator of Many Graces Flower Farm located at 15 Lawrence Plain Road. I understand that the last time you met as a board, Tom Quinlan offered some information regarding our new flower processing shed at the farm. I am sorry I wasn't able to make that meeting. Um, I was undergoing a medical procedure and couldn't be in attendance, but I am grateful for the opportunity to speak with you all tonight. I am, an, uh, I am accompanied on this call by Michael Doctor, our landlord at 15 Lawrence Plain Road, where we rent five and a half acres of certified organic of land in a field we refer to as the Lower Meadow. During the months of March through October, Next Barn Over Farm is the tenant of the main barn on site and Michael's farm, Winter Moon Roots, occupies a space throughout the fall and winter months. My farm is a year round tenant. <clears throat> I began growing flowers under the umbrella of Next Barn Over in a portion of what is referred to as their UPIC field about five years ago while I was attending school at UMass Amherst. I am the first person in my family to ever attend college and hold a college degree and come from a poor working class family from Orange Mass. I got my first job at Victory Supermarkets in Athol when I was just 11 years old. From that time, I have always held multiple jobs in order to survive. Beginning to farm during the summer months while I was attending UMass was a welcome solution for securing year-round employment. After starting a successful flower CSA under the umbrella of Next Barn Over Farm in 2016, I decided to branch off at, on my own and start my own business in 2018, and the farm name is Many Graces. I took over the lease of the Lower Meadow from Next Barn Over, and Michael Doctor welcomed me as the new tenant. It's important to note that Michael has been so much more than a landlord to me over the last few years. He has been incredibly accessible and generous as he has seen my small business grow substantially. I feel very grateful for his support, which he has offered to many young farmers in, in our area. When I started Many Graces just three seasons ago, I was only growing on a quarter of the five and a half acres. Flash forward to this year, and we have expanded to nearly four acres in production. When I first started, I had only one part-time employee, no infrastructure and no equipment, meaning I did not even have refrigeration for the flowers. I had absolutely no startup capital, but my lifelong ability to hustle and work really hard was my driving force to create something out of nothing. I stored 2000 tulips for my sister's wedding in the walk-in cooler at the Moan and Dove Bar in Amherst in my first year which speaks to my resourcefulness in finding solutions where there seem to be, not be any. In my first year in 2018, my primary sales outlets um, consisted of a 45 member CSA. I applied to and was accepted to the Amherst Farmers Market to sell Next Barn Over vegetables alongside our flowers. And I did small wedding florals for just four clients. After attending a specialty cut flower farmers conference in the winter of 2018, I realized that refrigeration was a must if my business had any chance in, to survive, in succeeding. Um, last season in early 2019, I secured a USDA loan from the FSA to purchase two very roughly used insulated trailers. Michael allowed, allotted us a small space behind the Next Barn Over Winter Moon Roots barn near the tree line of our field to set up our first semblance of infrastructure. It's important to note that the placement of our trailers was dictated by the requirements of the farm equipment that needs to move throughout the space because it is shared by three farms on the land. 
One of the trailers became our refrigerated cooler. The other became our workspace, a 24 foot long by seven foot wide enclosed trailer. We served 75 CSA members last year, continued to sell at the Amherst Farmers Market, but, but now with our own booth, began distributing flowers at Whole Foods locations in Western Mass and Boston, secured our first Manhattan account and designed flowers for 22 weddings. We also began wholesaling for the first time and developed partnerships with local businesses such as Black Birch and Glendale Ridge Vineyards and offered in-person floral design workshop once or twice a month, July through September. Our operation consisted of two full-time employees and two part-time employees, all of whom process flowers to prepare for distribution and events out of an extremely tight space, the 24 by seven container. As you all know, farming is an industry that is reliant on projected futures. Going into 2020, things were looking promising for many graces. In addition to retaining our accounts from 2019, I had 27 large scale weddings under contract. We had been invited to the Newton Farmers Market, the Northampton Tuesday Market, the Northampton Winters Farm, and the Northampton Winter Farmers Market. Additionally, the Formaggio's grocery chain in Boston and Pinch in downtown Northampton were set to begin selling our flowers retail. And we had booked a variety of year long workshops with local businesses. With the farm continuing to build its capacity for sales, I doubled our production uh, from the year prior. So my employees were slated to begin their field work the third week of March, which as we all know, was precisely when the severity of the pandemic became clear. I spent the next several weeks working tirelessly, attempting to sort through what seemed to be the total loss of our business. It was an extremely scary time, I know, for so many. Um, with what little finances we did have left from 2019's net profit, I had already invested in plants, but all of a sudden, I didn't even know how we were going to get them into the ground. We lost the entirety of our spring tulip crop because we were unable to distribute them to our CSA subscribers. And many who aren't in the cut flower world don't know this, but we grow tulips as annuals and they're almost uh, sometimes between a dollar and $2 a bulb. So when you're growing 10,000 bulbs, it's a huge financial impact. Needless to say, um, the financial impact of COVID was immediately felt. Being a third year farm whose sales outlets evaporated overnight and with no capital to fall back on, my singular goal this year was to literally save the business. One thing became immediately apparent in light of the pandemic. If we were going to be able to work at all, it was not possible to continue to have my staff processing flowers in such close proximity to one another inside the enclosed trailer. My partner and I began discussing the idea of removing the side of the container and building out a large shed that would attach to the container. We read the town of Hadley's website, which indicated that you did not need a building permit for a structure if it did not exceed 200 square feet. We spoke with Michael and ran the idea by him that we would build out a platform approximately 10 feet out from the front of the container and it would span approximately 20 of the 24 feet in length of the container. We wanted to make sure that this plan didn't interfere with the path of any equipment that would be operated by Next Barn Over or Winter Moon. We were and still are incredibly grateful that Michael approved of a solution that would allow us to continue to work given the severity of the health and safety concerns we were, we were facing and the, and the potential prospect that we wouldn't be able to work at all if we didn't have a larger space to work in. I want to make it abundantly clear that my farm has survived this wild year because we were able to build out this processing shed constructed with all volunteer hours. It was a critical solution to the problem we were facing because of the public health and safety mandates as dictated by the pandemic. I was awarded an emergency farm fund loan fund loan that was jointly funded by CESA and the Franklin County Community Development Fund and have used that money towards building materials for the flower processing shed. Despite not knowing that this was something that would need to be permitted, the structure was built to code. We had Orchard Electric run the uh, electrical lines to power the containers in 2019 when they were delivered. The container that serves as a refrigerator 
and the combined container processing shed are literally the only assets that my business has. We are a farm that still does not own a tractor. <laughs> we hand plant every single flower. This year that looked like 36,520 plants. While our public appearance is one of beautiful abundance, we are the definition of soup to nuts, creating something out of nothing every single day. Sorry. <laughs> It is truly miraculous that our business has survived this year. But when you pull back the curtain, I have hustled 80 to 120 hour weeks since March to make that happen. My partner has been a full-time volunteer since losing their job in March and I have not paid myself at all. Not one time. I am living off my partner's unemployment. Everything that we have done has been an act of survival. I passionately love what I do and I love my staff. My primary concern this year was to keep my staff and our community safe. <clears throat> Bringing beauty in the form of flowers is such a powerful act, especially now in these really difficult times. <clears throat> and we have received feedback to that effect all year long. Even though the work itself is far from easy, I could quickly spout off an impressive list of new accounts that I have worked hard to cultivate and maintain this year that helped meet payroll every week. That could, and that could be one way of conveying to you all that we are continuing to build an incredibly viable business. <clears throat> Out of this small little building in the far corner of an unassuming tree line, tucked away behind another farm's barn, making do with what we have and making it up as we go along. But the less quantifiable emotional aspect of what surrounds this business is what I feel towards my staff, who is like family. We have all worked so hard this year under incredibly difficult circumstances to help this farm and one another survive. Our connection to the existence, sorry, our connection to the community continues to build and the root of why that has been possible is truly because of the existence of actual infrastructure. The processing shed is everything to this business. Our 2020 business plan revolved around weddings, yet we survived this year with no weddings. We had three and a half acres of flowers that we had no idea how we were going to get them off the field seven months ago. But we began operating as a wholesaler, which was only possible because we built a space from which we could work safely and process our flowers. What has become clear is that the space that was a creative solution born out of a need for a safe working environment in the midst of a pandemic has actually become the cornerstone of our business. Our business would have literally become unviable without the building and our business will certainly not survive without it. <clears throat> we are here tonight because I made a mistake and I'm really sorry. <laughs> I didn't know that I needed to seek a permit for this build out. I truly didn't. I thought that because the container was an established anchor point from 2019, that we could build off of that as it related to the shed square footage guidance by the town. I am truly sorry. I do know that what I did right in this scenario is saving my farm and saving the jobs of my staff under incredibly difficult circumstances. As a side note, we didn't qualify for the PPP loan because this was the first year that we had a payroll. So the odds of financially surviving this year have been stacked against us from the beginning. I plan to be a business owner in this community for a long time, and I am 100% committed to establishing convivial working relationships with all of you. I pride myself in my integrity and am a rule follower by nature. I assure you that I would have never jeopardized my relationships with all of you, nor my businesses standing in the town, had I known that I was in violation of any rules. I regret that this is the first time that you're meeting me, and I do hope that we can work together to solve this issue in a way that will allow my business to continue on. I feel like I need to make it clear at this moment that while we have in fact survived this year so far, any requirements put forth by the board that carry with it a large financial burden could be proved to be untenable for the farm. What I'm asking for you tonight is to consider my particular circumstances as a new business owner from a working class background in the midst of a pandemic to please accept my sincere apology. 
sincere and to be as generous as possible with what you require of me moving forward. I will also note as a last thing that Juanita and Kevin, our neighbors closest to the property line where the building is located, have said that they that we should make it known tonight that they have no issue with us or our building, that they love what we are doing and they offer their full support. Thank you all for your time tonight. I look forward to the discussion that follows and to hopefully being able to meet you all in person at some point in the near future. Okay. So let me throw in some background information here. <clears throat> this comes to us on a referral from the building inspector who only within the last month became aware that this operation was going on. And his first concern or his concern with regard to us is um, <clears throat> he, he wanted us to make a determination whether or not the use is uh, allowed in the district. And secondly, whether um, it would require a local business, it's a local business district, whether it would require a, um, a special permit to operate in the local business or whether it is um, agriculturally exempt. Okay. Couple, I'm, I'm Jim Maximoski, chairman of the planning board. A couple of comments here. That first of all, I think as, a, as I can speak for the board saying, we understand your predicament, especially in the light of the COVID and the virus and everything else. So we're not here to chastise you and condemn you and the rest of the stuff. My opinion is you are a floricultural use, which is allowed in an in a, in a residential district, irregardless of the local business district. It is, you are growing flowers. Yes. That is a floricultural use and that is permitted in the agricultural residential district, period. My only concern here is that you have storage trailers on site. <clears throat> the refrigerated trailers, those are not permitted. Long-term, those have to go, okay? Um, I would be more than, the end of the pandemic is, to be honest, nowhere near in sight. And if we told you to get rid of those today, I can fully understand we would condemn your business to nothing. Yeah. So that is not our, um, that's not our intention. On this board, whether or not you know it, you have essentially four of the five members in one way or another have been involved in agricultural use over their time. So we fully can appreciate what you are going through and what you unfortunately will yet to go through because next year, who knows what it's going to be. This, I mean, I'm talking 2021. Yes. I would be willing to give you a extension on keeping those storage trailers for a period of let's say one year and you come back and talk to us next fall, depending how next summer, how next year goes. And we might be willing to extend it or tell you, okay, you had a good year, things are looking good and would give you a time frame to get rid of the trailers with something permanent. I'm talking about the refrigerated trailers. Okay. okay. May, may I make, may I, may I, may I say, say something to that? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Well, I appreciate everything um, that you've extended in terms of, you know, uh, understanding towards my situation. And if I, if I, if I may under, if I may say, like my understanding of the, um, well, what I learned after Tom Quinlan came and spoke with us, um, the 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 trail, the storage trailers um, aren't allowed by the town because they're essentially eyesores, they're ugly, correct? They're not permitted by the town, period. I Whether see. or not they're an ice or storage trailers are not permitted in any district in town, period. Okay, so, um, my, okay, my, the, the cooler, I just have one refrigerated trailer that is the cooler. Um, the original trailer has been completely 
and closed. Uh, it's like not a trailer anymore. It is, it is the new structure. Um, so in, in that case, are you speaking just about the refrigerated, the refrig like my, my cooler, it's essentially my floral cooler. I haven't seen what, I don't know what your facility looks like, so I can't answer that question. I see, okay. I would, I would get, guess that if one of your trailers has been basically enclosed by a building, so that it's essentially no longer a trailer, but it's a, if it's within a building, I, your, the zoning bylaw may not apply to that particular unit. Um, that would be that yet that would yet would yet to be determined. Okay. Okay, because we haven't seen it, so we can't really answer that one question. Is it is it on is it on tires in the building or is it sitting on the floor? It's on skid. Um, the the walk-in cooler is on skids on the ground. It's, uh -huh. it's. I mean, when I first got them delivered, they they were like they're they're impermanent. It's an impermanent um, structure. So. Uh, but I guess like I, I've seen other farms in the area, um, basically enclose their, their, when, when, you know, using a shipping container in the way that I am is, uh, a very like financially sound, like it's basically a way for me to get a walk-in cooler without spending $10,000 for a compressor system. I was able to get a commercially grade. Yeah. yeah. It's essentially prefabricated. Yeah. So, uh, I, I think, I think Mix, Jimmy, Jim Maximowski's uh, uh, comments are Solomon like, and we should uh, get somebody to propose that we vote on that, Jim. If that's okay with you, Rebecca. Well, first of all, Rebecca, who owns the land and who is applying for the building permit? Michael is the landowner. And he's not appearing, but so you are going to yes. build. Uh, he is Joe. He's Michael's uh, here. Michael, doc, Michael, doc, hey, Michael. this meeting. And, so, and Bowmaster are there. I, who, will, who will eventually own the building and, and who will be applying for the building permit? Can you hear me, Joe? Yeah, you just. Yes. Hey, sorry, I was muted. Uh, and my name may say maybe my wife's name underneath me, but and Bowmaster I'm Michael. Um, so I I own the building, Joe. You own the land. You uh, own the trailers to well, and are you applying for the building permit? Building, and and I, I assume I would have to do that. And I'd be happy to do that. Yes. I I thought they were building a sh you know a small shed in the beginning, and and it it grew and it. You know, I didn't think it was. Anyway, yes, I would be happy to apply for a building permit. So that that actually keys into a point that I wanted to raise <clears throat> that we we're primarily looking at zoning issues. And as Jim said, I think you've satisfied us that you are a floriculture use. It's allowed by right in the district. Um, so we're now off to some of the structural things. We don't have any direct jurisdiction over that. Um, you mentioned, for example, that the wiring was up to code because it was done by a licensed electrician. But as far as I know, and you'd have to check with the building department, he may never have pulled a uh, electrical permit to do that. So um, whether he did or not, I don't know. And it doesn't really affect us in any way. But I just want to highlight that um, you do have to work with the uh, the building department to uh, square away what's going on because until recently, the building department was not aware of the operation. I think it was looked at as maybe an extension of uh, Michael's farm as a whole and not, they weren't aware that there was a separate business operating there with separate premises and so on. So, um, I think you're okay with us. Your use is allowed. The way you're set up may have to be adjusted, but for all we know, by the time all of this is over, your trailers are gonna be rusted out and you're gonna to wanna to put up a real building anyway. And you'll be able to afford to do it. Um, 
So, uh, but you're going to have to work with the building department to be sure that you're square with them because there may be some permitting issues that were, I, I don't know, you, you said because it was under a certain number of square foot, square feet, you thought you didn't need permitting. I, I'm not sure where you saw that. Um, I looked at the, the, the Hadley website, uh, I don't know, in the early summer. Um, but, and I told Tom Quinlan that when he came to the farm and he said that I was, look, I was looking at the incorrect, that, that the 200 square feet is only for residential properties and that this would be considered a non-residential property. And so I just, I, but I, well, I didn't know that. Okay, well, that's, that's an issue between you and him and it's not an issue with us, but I, we, we have had circumstances in the past where people talk to us and they think that clears the decks for everything. It doesn't, but I think uh, I'll, I'll agree that, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure we even need to take a vote. Well, we can take a vote to, to a finding that, that you are a floriculture use and that we would invite you back in a year to review your situation with regard to the trailers. Okay. I, thank you. I do just want to make clear that it is just one refrigerated trailer at this point, at this, at this time. Um, and that we could, we could essentially enclose it so that it, like if, so that it wasn't an issue with the town anymore. Um, it's our yeah. only, it's our only refrigeration. So right. it, it would be difficult to lose it because you can't really run a farm without a cool space yeah. to store and, your and, and And we're not, we don't have a problem with your refrigeration, but speaking for somebody who has a multitude of years working on trailers, mm -hmm. um, the people, Mr. Mr. Dwyer is correct. Even if you have a refrigerated trailer, it will eventually corrode. So my advice to you is don't put the put your farm, if you would, at risk of a of a refrigerated container. You may save a few bucks today, but down the road, if you have to get rid of it and it's enclosed, you may end up tearing down your structure I to see. get rid of the trailer and build a new one. So again, just be cautious, be aware of that, and it's your money. I'm not going to tell you how to run it. We don't tell you how to run a business. It's your business. Yes. I um, if it's enclosed and it is not exposed to the outside, if it's enclosed in a building, then I guess it wouldn't be considered um, a storage trailer to the outside. But I would just caution you, separate from zoning issues, be careful what you do with it because it could bite you down the road. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that advice. I yeah, appreciate it. If you do anticipate enclosing it, you'll have to be aware of sideline setbacks and other zoning right. issues. Yeah, you do. You do have to meet. You have to. You do have to meet zoning requirements. You're exempt as far as your use goes, but you're not exempt from any other zoning issues. Agricultural still has to comply with ninety-five percent of the of the zoning of zoning items. Okay, so you know. Maybe you want to make a we want to make a motion that we would give her a one year reprieve on the trailers on the storage trailers. Um, come back to us next fall, and depending what you've done, you may be okay. You may have to remove if you've enclosed them, and we'll have to we, depending what you do over that time frame. Okay, okay. I'll okay. make a motion to recognize the, that this use is floriculture, which is allowed by right, but request the. Uh, uh, return in one year to review the use of trailers and or storage containers. Second. Motion and second. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Motion. Anybody opposed? Motion passes unanimously. <laughs> Good luck. From all, it's you and all the other farmers that are in the same boat. Thank you very much. Um, may I, I just have one question about next steps for myself. So should I be in touch with Tom Quinlan to have and Michael to get the building permit? Like, what are my next steps? You, you need to contact the building inspector and probably the electrical inspector and let them discuss and maybe, you know, have Michael, Michael included, 
to yeah. discuss what you need to do because we don't know what you need to do exactly. Okay, okay great. Yeah. I can do that. Like Mr. Dwyer says, we're only zoning. Building permit, electrical and plumbing are all the building department. Can I ask you a question that I, I, and you can please tell me if it doesn't pertain to zoning. You know, her, her structure is too close to the neighbor. And is that, is, is that not a zoning issue that? That is a zoning issue. She's too close to the neighbor. She needs to be 15 foot side yard setback. Okay. And 15 foot rear. And, it, and if she's not, is there any kind of, she is right now, is there any kind of variance process that she could? You can go for a variance and you need to show a hardship, which she does not have. Uh, is the, your, your barn itself is pretty close to the property line, isn't it? And she's behind the barn, is that it? Yeah. She's behind the barn, she's a little bit closer to the neighbor, but I, I, I think the point is well taken. I don't think my existing barn is, is, uh, is 15 a full 15 feet from the neighbor either. If, 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 because your barn is too close to the neighbors, the building inspector typically has said, if you extend the structure and you know are no closer to the side yard than your existing barn is, they've typically, the building inspector, when Mr. Neihart was there, typically would let that go. Well, let's, I'm just gonna use a number. Let's say your barn is 10 feet from the sideline. As long as her structure is 10 feet or more, the building inspector, Tim and I heard again prior would say that's okay. But if you're nine and a half feet off the sideline, that's not okay. And that's what something you need so, to talk to the building. So, inspector. yep, the, the building zoning, inspector is the zoning <coughs> enforcement officer as well. Yeah, he is the zoning enforcement officer. We don't have any enforcement authority. So um, he, he's been very reasonable about working with people. If, if there's not a major issue and no major objections, there are ways to work it out, but talk with the building inspector about options. Okay. We're, uh, we, we don't, he doesn't work for us. We don't have any authority over his, his actions, although we do coordinate, but uh, he, he makes the final call. Okay. Okay. Thank you all very much. Good luck. Thank you. You too, you too Mr. Doctor. Good luck with your business. Appreciate it. <laughs> Got a lot of roots to get out of the ground yet. <laughs> uh, well, supposed to warm up to start growing again this week. <laughs> supposed to be almost 70 on Saturday and Sunday. Oh, so I had initially invited uh, Carolyn Brennan, the new town administrator, to join us for 645. Um, if you don't, if, if you have the time, uh, we can go through the rest of our uh, sort of business session. You can see what's going on. If you're pressed for time, uh, we could step in, step, bring you in right now. No, I am fine. I was, I was planning to stay anyways, so that's okay. fine. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Kelly Casella was next up. Thank you. Um, by the way, that's my wife's name showing up there. My name is oh. Ray Casella. But if you call Casella. me Kelly, I don't mind. <laughs> Not a problem. I'm pretty used to being called whatever, you know, it's in our area. My name is Ray Casella. I'm an architect um, for the Roman Catholic Diocese of Springfield. Our firm is Casella Design Associates, LLC. Um, so we're coming here on behalf of the Roman Catholic Diocese of Springfield, most notably uh, Most Holy Redeemer Church uh, on, on Russell Street here in Hadley. Um, I'm speaking for Reverend uh, Peter um, Paulus, who is the pastor. Um, I was told yesterday by Tom, um, the building inspector, I think he was acting very kindly, saying that we might want to speak with you this evening. Father Paulus would like to add um, a tower in front of the church. Now, before everyone gets nervous when he says a tower, he's talking about a 35-foot bell tower. It's a three-legged open structure that will have a bell hanging in it, and it will have a crucifix, or not a crucifix, it's actually a cross at the top. So we're talking a, a total height after it sits on the ground, 
36 feet off the ground to the tip of the cross. Now, um, I did a little bit of research, and forgive me if I make errors, but um, the church is in the B business zone, and I believe we have a height of 42 feet, so I believe we comply on our height being 36 feet tall. Um, the only issue I think that might be of interest for Tom, and I don't know if he's raised it or not, but I noticed it by, by just listening as we were speaking tonight. I believe your front yard setback in the business zone is 50 feet. Um, and I and I would ask um, if someone knows otherwise, please correct me. But I did look that up just before the meeting and I hope that is um, still current. Um, the, the placement of this um, tower would like to be in that round traffic circle in the very center of the driveway in front of the church. And I believe the center line of this tower is approximately 44 feet or 40 feet from the um, from the uh, property line. Now, just for clarification, the property line and the easement for Route 9 is at the back side of the sidewalk. So the sidewalk sits on the easement. The grass that starts behind that sidewalk moving towards the church oh, is all church property. So if we measure from that sidewalk, um, I believe if you measure back about, I want to say 40, 40 feet plus or minus, you will hit the center of the tower. But I believe that that is not um, correctly uh, in line with your 50 foot front yard setback. So I believe that is what Tom is referring to, because I think we're compliant on everything else. Um, so again, this is our first pass. And I just wanted to um, make you aware of the situation. And I don't know if we have the ability to screen share. I can show you the, um, we had heritage survey come out to make absolutely sure where that front line was that route nine sits in. So we were definitely measuring from the right point. They have put survey stakes on the property. Um, so if anyone's more than welcome to look at them, if they wish their official um, survey stakes and that island has been there forever. I think it's pretty hard to miss it, that little round circle of grass in his driveway where he would like to place this. Okay, so just a couple of comments. I am on the finance committee for the church. So I think I should excuse myself from participating in this discussion. Um, do you have the, the picture of what, somebody had pictures at our last meeting of what the bell tower looks like. Do you have that available? I have it. If I can have a screen share, I'll put it right up for you. If some, is that possible? Can I? Yeah, do I that? just enabled screen sharing for you. Okay, thank you. Um, if you could just give me one second while I bring these up, and I will show you. Um, uh, appearing right now. Uh, can you please? Uh, can you see that? Yes. Yeah. That is what Verdin, the company that is manufacturing this. Now, just for a clarification, our involvement was father has having Verdun. Um, create this. We're diocesan architects. They um, asked us to come in because it needs a foundation. So our structural engineer is designing this, the foundation for this. And because we happen to be doing that, they asked if we would do this presentation for you. So I'm stepping in a little bit cold. So please bear with me. But that is the picture. And if I'm allowed, I can also show you um, the setback in the area exactly where it's going if you have a moment. Yes. Okay, thank you. I'm going to switch again, and I will bring that up. I believe you did send uh, us a package on this, and I forwarded it to everybody. I don't thank know if you, you have a chance to look at it yet. Yes. Now, if if I could, I'm going to show you this red line that I'm drawing right now. That is the that is the edge of the easement from that line down is owned by, or is the easement for the state of Massachusetts for Route 9, from that line towards the parish is owned by the church. And you'll notice this 44 foot three, that is the center line of the tower. Um, the tower is going to sit on a 12 foot concrete pier. It is partially underground, so you won't see it. The tower base is about six foot circle in diameter. It just has to be a bigger piece of concrete because of the overturning moment of the tower. But that tower- is is every is everyone seeing the screen? I I lost it. I got it. I've got it. Okay, it popped up and then it disappeared. No. Okay. Anyway, go ahead. I, I, okay. Um, I apologize if it disappeared. Um, but if you remember that circular um circle in the middle is the traffic island in the property. That's where Father would like to place this um tower that he's purchasing from Verdun. 
you, you take in consideration that this is the historical district of town and this kind of doesn't fit that at all, does it? Um, I, I, mean, I, I again would be the wrong person to ask. I mean, I, 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 had, I had no say in it other than father asked me to say, this is what he wants to put in front of his church. Well, well by that standard, the church itself yeah, you're right. It's not but, but, not well, white clabbered. No, it's not. It does not fit the, the the South Hadley mold that I that I know. I've we, we have relatives that live in that area, and that's definitely not South Hadley. But unfortunately, she's existing. Well, I think it's you know I'm being a good Catholic. I'll say this: it's uglier than hell. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, bear in mind that it is probably. Uh, uh, probably falls under the Dover Amendment. Yeah. So uh, I was waiting for that one, Bill. And I, so and uh, that's that's what they said about the uh, spire on the Mormon Church in Belmont. That uh, that didn't get any traction there either. Well, I, I made my comment, and I understand that, but I think it's really really ugly. So certainly, the Dover Amendment makes for those people in the in the background, not aware of the Dover Amendment, it does give it pretty much uh, absolution, uh, to use the phrase. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, uh, the uh, the planning board cannot overlook the fact that it is within the setback bounds. It's and uh, to me, it would probably require ZBA approval, and this is kind of a unique situation where they could indicate it is probably a hardship. What do you think, eminent barrister Dwyer? Uh, I don't think it's that much different than a, uh, than a sign in front. So uh, it's, it's not a structure per se. So I, I'm not sure it is affected by the front yard setback in the same way uh, an expansion of the building would be. Uh, and to play devil's advocate to play on your absolution. <laughs> um, you know, from a building perspective, you would say it is a structure because it is something which could fall and kill someone. So, uh, you know, you can play that either way. I had a question about what said a speaker panel on the, on the top is, is, is there going to be a speaker? Is that the, um, I would answer this way. Again, um, I'm only doing the foundations from our firm, but I would say that when I spoke with Father, there was no speaker. The, um, the only thing he was saying um, that would be put out there was the tower, a bell, and I believe it's from a previous um, um, diocesan church that is going to be hung on that, which you saw. Um, I lost my screen share, so I, I would put it back up, but um, I can't um, do so. Um, if you want, I can put it back up. I can, I can deal with that. Thank okay. you. I'll put that back up because I think we all need to look at that one. We all need to look at that. I'm sorry to what's, offend what, some eyes. What's, what's father's name again? Pitor. P i o t r Paulus. Yeah, this is this is. You might see something like this in Poland. <laughs> <laughs> I'm half Polish, so I can say yes. I well, I'm a hundred percent. So then you have a you have fifty percent better eye than I, and yes, I think um father was very strongly saying that he would that it did tie into Poland. As you'll notice, they have a picture of the bell that is there. I believe that's just mesh work at the top. There are no speakers on it. There is a, a cross on the top, um, and I imagine that there would be some sort of a light um, within it. And again, we are fully aware, and I made them aware, that this has to be dark sky compliant, whether or not you have it in your zoning bylaws, which I'm sure you must, um, it would be. But um, there is no speaker on it that I'm aware of. Okay. Uh, your presentation said it was internally lit. Does that mean there is a light within the structure, or are you saying that the that the legs are translucent? Um, no, I was suggesting that they put LED lights um, on the structure itself so you can have down light. The minute you get anything from the building aiming up at it, I think we've um, violated your dark sky compliance because we're gonna be putting on um, light pollution upwards. So my word was, if you're going to light this, the bell, the crucifix, it has to be inward shielded, aiming downward, it cannot, 
put light on any neighbor or put light up into the sky. And Father was not aware of that, but he is aware of that now and said he would absolutely um, comply with that. It sounds like, I think you said it was 41 or 44 feet back from the from the front yard. So I'm going to switch back to that so you can see that. Yeah, um, so if you push it back the uh, six feet, uh, it won't be in the center of your circle, but it, would it still fit within your circle? I think you could push it back if you had it off center um, um, because you're 44 feet. All you would need is six feet. So it would be pretty well. The structure itself would be outside of the center of the circle. The foundation sticks out about another four feet beyond the base of this. So I or six feet beyond the base of it. The, there's a 12 by 12 foot um, four foot deep concrete mat that is poured in the ground. Then there's a little one foot piece that sticks up that this sits on. So you only see the three little one foot legs that stick up, but there's a mass underneath so the wind doesn't roll it over. Um, so I would imagine worst case scenario, that foundation is going to be, if you took half of that 12, which is six, and you take 44 minus six, you're talking about 38 feet from the setback line. Foundation being underground, right? Right, right. And I would say center of mass is still 44 feet. Um, being being um, uh, more of a classical architect, anything off center obviously would be rather painful for me. But um, then again, I don't live in your community, so um, I certainly wouldn't have be the right person to ask. Mr. Dwyer, what does if the above ground visible structure is outside of the setback but underground foundation is crossing it is that acceptable that should not be a problem we've had projects that have um propane tanks buried in the 50-foot front yard setback okay. if i'm remembering correctly right. um mark's question is a good one a swimming pool however is considered a structure and it was it is not permitted in the setback or the side yard Although I do like the argument that this is a basically a sign of Christendom and that you're putting up a sign just to bolster my own argument or my own side's argument. Well, let's not call it a sign because then we're going to ask you how many square feet it is. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> now, certainly from our neighbor across the river, the bell uh, was very controversial in that town for a while. Uh, is that bell going to be ringing the bell will be ringing, and I believe it's on a device they shut it off at, um, you know, like all of them, they shut off at dusk so you don't annoy the neighbors. And I don't think it's a time bell. I think it's for the, they're like Angelian bells. They ring at 12 o'clock for the call to prayer. Um, I do I do not think he was, his intention was to make it a bell that rung for setting time like the ones you have in, in, in town. There's no clock attached to it. And there was power coming up in one of the legs. That would be for the uh, mechanical ringer. Correct. That would be for the ringer. And also if there was LED lights that I, uh, that he wanted. I believe there's already power there because I he told me there's power there from a previous um, something that was in that island. So I'm, I'm unaware of what it was, but something was there one time. The statue of the Lady of the Rose that used to be sitting in that island. And there's lights. There's power. To, they used to shine up on the lights on it. Thank you. So from uh, the planning board perspective, uh, we cannot give permission because that's the building inspector's authority. So we can give approval. And uh, is that probably all that you're asking for now? Absolutely. And I think I'd be happy to work with Tom and whatever Tom's ruling is, we understand it is what it is. He wanted me to come to you um, to, I think, make you aware. And of course, we, I appreciate you giving me the hearing. So whatever guidance you could give, I'm happy to take. And color, that is, is there a color specified? The image made it look almost like a, like a metal that is, um, I, I'm, uh, Kathy Zaja may be on. She's also a member of the committee. Um, do you know anything, Kathy, about the color? Because he did not mention it to me. No, I don't. As a matter of fact, it was something I was going to check, you know, um, 
and do just a little bit more research with our committee too. So, uh, because I know it, it really does jump out at you and from the church and it, could there be a color that would blend in a little bit more? I mean, I hope it, I mean, I hope it would, this stands out no matter what you do to it. Um, it stands out because it's in front of the church and it is a very prominent piece of property in front of the church. Um, of course, I would be very much happier if it blended because I think it would soften it, but that's just me. Mr. Sarsinski, any thoughts? Other than I think it's, I think it's, I think it's garish. So. I think it complements the structure. <clears throat> Well, We're all being so, so kind. <laughs> yeah. Well, any, so are we looking for a motion to, and uh, let me just ask my board members, are, can we approve it and leave it to Tom to make sure it's outside the 50 feet or that's, isn't that our purview to make sure it's, I don't think it's our call, Mark. I mean, okay. Bill may disagree. And uh, technically, if he wants to go with our per permission, if he wants to go ahead and issue the permit, that's fine. But if he feels uncomfortable, according to the, the exactness of the law, probably should go to the ZBA. But uh, I don't think there would be an objection there. Yeah, this this probably is something that it's it's enough out of our jurisdiction or it sort of teeters on the edge of our jurisdiction. Um, it's not really a commercial structure, so uh, site plan approval really doesn't apply. Um, it's in the village center overlay district, but it is probably a beneficiary of the Dover Amendment, which allows religious institutions to build with limited regard for, for zoning. Um, uh, I think maybe the ZBA would be better set than we are to put time limits on, um, on the Bell's plane. Um, and they could, uh, they could grant us a, a setback variance or maybe some other, maybe there's another way around it, a finding that it's an expansion of a prior non-conforming use. Um, those are more areas um, for the ZBA that uh, I, I don't think this really raises fundamental zoning issues. So Bill, do we need to make a motion or? I don't think so because I, I, you know, they're they're asking, ready it by us for our input, and uh, you know, my my suggestion is that uh, either I'll either concur that the building inspector will uh, will sign off on it if we don't object to it, or the building inspector can can bump it over to ZBA if there needs to be some adjustment about setbacks. I'd be very happy just to say I'd be very happy with that finding and then we will that way that way we let the building inspector decide which way he wants and if we have to go to zoning board I'd be of appeals happy to do so uh, whatever whatever works as I said we the, the church wants to be there the diocese wants to be here in perpetuity so our goal from the diocese is not to ruffle feathers but to make sure we all live in harmony and my my directive is to make sure that the the town is looked after also so whatever whatever you feel comfortable with is I think wonderful for us I think I, I'm comfortable just deferring to the uh, building inspector and his call on whether to refer it on to the ZBA or whether he feels he's comfortable acting on what's before him. Uh, but if you want to make a motion, I'll make a motion to refer it back to the uh, building inspector. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? With no further discussion. If not, all in favor of the motion say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. And I abstain. Motion passes. Four, zero, oh, and one. Thank you very much, all of you, for your time and patience. We appreciate it very much. And again, uh, from the diocesan and from Father's Point, thank you very much for your time this evening. Okay. Thank you. I'll give Mike, I'll give Tom the uh, paperwork bill for that one. Okay. Okay. You want to go outside? And, oh, um, uh, Bill, is that something where you issue that form that says, you know, you still have to comply with all these other... So because, it's over the case, because we didn't waive site plan approval, we just we clearly just referred it on to someone else. So I think that's clear enough that they're going somewhere else. Okay. Now I did have a Sharon pop in at one point uh, next, but I don't see any Sharon still here. So uh, that was my. I'm on my wife's laptop. It was Sharon Summers. Oh, okay. Okay. Then uh, Mark Richard and John Summers, are you together? Yeah. Yes, yes sir. Okay. Uh, so I'll, um, I'll go through this. We're, we're requesting a, um, a change of use. Uh, we were notified we, we should come uh, before you to talk about a change of use. This is for um, One Mill Valley Road. Uh, unit E. We are, uh, I'm the business manager for, uh, for the Greenfield Commonwealth Virtual School. We're a public school of choice in Massachusetts and uh, online school. Um, we're leasing this, uh, this property at One Mill Valley Road, uh, Unit E, as a support center uh, uh, for students. So it's not the school, it's, it's just a, a support center for students to come to get extra help. Um, I, I, I'm, I was told that the, the location is currently uh, zoned or, or, or categorized as retail. And so this would be a, a change. So um, I'm here to uh, you know, speak on that. John Summers is doing, um, doing uh, work for us on the interior, which is just a minor uh, building, a couple small um, offices for teachers to uh, to utilize. Um, we have no, I don't have anything ex externally to provide to you. Um, uh, I was told that signage would need to come in front of the, the, the planning board. We don't, uh, because of COVID, we don't think we're going to be, ha be having any students anytime this school year, the 2021 school year. Therefore, we're moving, you know, we're moving along with things, but we don't have any, uh, I, we don't have any signage um, Yet I don't have any uh, anything designed uh, or any, anything like that, but we would just go along with the kind of the motif of the the, the current signage there. But um, I don't have anything at this time, and I, there's no external um, build out or changes that we're uh, looking for. So I'm I'm here to answer any questions and and hopefully get your approval on this uh, this change of use uh, request. What is the name of your of the of the business or school again? Yep. Yeah, the school the school is a Greenfield Commonwealth Virtual School. We have about a thousand students across the state that are all it's online, and like I said, we're school of choice, so it's um, students or uh, school districts across the state. You know, um, either recommend or or students uh, apply. Uh, I say apply. They, we have a wait list right now with, with COVID, but uh, to, to come to school uh, uh, online with us. I just need I just need a title when I fill the form out. That's sure. all. I need for Understood. Us. Okay. So Mark, that's in the that's in the structure where the tap room is. Yes, that's a few doors down. There's a, a, a dentist office next right next door to us. Uh, I think the tap room is there, and then there's a dance uh, studio that's uh, one of the other uh, tenants. So parking should be adequate. Would yes, be because like it's a small, it's a very small number of, of students, and they would be um, some of them would be uh, just bussed and, and dropped off uh, for the period of time that there we would arrange that for them to be bussed and dropped off and then picked up. So and it would be only during um, the day, only uh, during school days. Um, and so we have a normal, you know, kind of school day schedule, you know, eight o'clock drop off or so, eight, seven thirty, eight o'clock, and then picking up a two, two thirty. There's a small staff that would be there 
uh, four, you know, possibly five uh, 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 teachers that would be there. And, and from a student perspective, you're, you're looking at, you know, about eight students uh, that would, would be rotating in and out of there. Um, and when I say rotating in and out, it's not throughout the day, it's just different days. There might be students coming at different, uh, uh, different days of the week. How many square feet is unit E? It's about 2,000 square feet. So one of the questions, does this qualify as an educational institution and would it qualify for the Dover Amendment? Question number one. And uh, Mark Dunn's question was a good one because uh, if it's a very successful school and all of a sudden you have more visitors, we'll run into the same problem that the Chinese Immersion School ran into in that the drop-off situation with uh, parents dropping the kids off uh, becomes a traffic concern. So we would like to know more exactly how many potentially you could have there so we wouldn't run into that. And yeah. another point of view is that the, uh, the dispensary for the adult marijuana use has been uh, kind of kicked out of the Hampshire Mall and they've been looking for other spaces. And one of the spaces mentioned was in that building. And uh, if you go in- Joe, no, it was not in that building. No, I, but if they did go into that building, that means your, your landlord should be aware of that. It's the house, I think. It's a house there that they're going to want right. to go in. It's the house next door. Is there so many hundred feet they have to be? But it, but it would still be within range. It would be in range is correct, Jim. Yeah. But number, number one, the, uh, the potential build out maximum students that you would prefer to have in there. And uh, yeah, the, the, the school is talking about 10 students. So this is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a small um, initiative that the, the state had, had liked that we were providing extra support where a student could come on site. But because, you know, again, <laughs> the logistics of, you know, our students are from are all over the place. So this is, there's a small number that would, that, you know, would, would come into this spot. So <clears throat> we're looking at a maximum of 10 students there at any, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to be in that, that space. Um, it's being utilized, you know, with a, our special education teachers would, would be office there. So they would be more of the regular um, staff that, that's there. But again, there's a small number of them. And because they can work remotely, it's, a, uh, it's an option uh, for them to be there as, a, as an office. But it's not intended to grow. The growth would be if we, if we were seeing growth, it would be to have another support center put uh, in a different location in the state where it could serve, you know, Central Mass students or, or, or on North Shore, east, uh, 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 eastern part of the state. That's the, if, if this worked out and we had growth there. Otherwise, the growth in the school is really online. And the, I'll be honest, the, the desire for people to be at on site in the school is, is, is low. And that's what oftentimes why they're, they come to the virtual school, so it's not a uh, it's not a thought or a a, uh, a desire to grow the the um, the number of, of students uh, to attend that school, uh, that support center, and it's, and it's a support center. It's it's for extra help, for extra support, not for um, not for day to day. Hey, you come here every day for school. Okay, I've got a question. Has nothing to do with zoning, but uh, once you become educational. Does that property become tax exempt or that part of the property become tax exempt? No. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. The owner is, uh, is not tax exempt. Right. So right. The, the landlord will be paying taxes on the building as a whole, just like fish and wildlife. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I just knew you were going to say that. Wildlife. Very good. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> fish and wildlife rents from uh, Pearson, so they pay taxes on that. Yes. So actually, you're, Mark, technically, you're not asking for a change in use. It's a permitted use in the area that you're looking to uh, settle well, in. 
Yeah, technically, yeah, technically, yes, it is a change yeah. of views. Change of use is a trigger for site plan approval. Correct. So um, we want to know if a if a restaurant was going in there, um, but I think this is within waiver country, and they've already signed and returned the um, yeah. the uh, acknowledgement that the waiver of site plan approval is not a green light to do whatever you want. Any other discussion? I'll make a motion to waive further site plan approval. Second. second. Motion second. Any other discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. I will get a note off to the building inspector and you should be able to proceed accordingly. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, gentlemen. All right. All right. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Good night. Good luck. Thank you. Hey, we have Ken. What's he here for? Uh, probably further discussion of the uh, the buyout clause, but also to meet Carolyn, I'm sure. Although I think you may have met before. We have. Just for the record, Carolyn, um, Kim Comia is with the Piney Valley Planning Commission. He is the representative to this planning board for consult consultation on the various zoning items that we subcontract them. We've been subcontracting PVPC for probably, I don't know how many years, 10 Most anyway. The, between 10, 10 and 15. Plus, yeah, 10 plus years. And they've been kind of acting like a, uh, a bit of a planner for us and they help us write zoning bylaws, we'll do research for zoning items, zoning issues, give us consultation and stuff like that. And they they do a very good job. And they support what, like 40 other communities? That's our, that's our region. But as far as the planning board assistance, it's, um, it's a more manageable three. <laughs> Great, okay. But yeah, I do work on other projects in other communities. We were the and first ones to do that. And after we started utilizing them, there were quite a few, you know, the others that signed up to do the similar writing because it was, it was very successful. And it was good for both. And from, from Carolyn's perspective, uh, Ken, we realize we don't need a full-time planner. And he certainly acts as our consultant, as Bill was saying. And it still gives us the responsibility of doing a lot of the own research ourselves too. So uh, I think we're a little bit more than citizen soldiers. That, that sort of is a nice segue into uh, <clears throat> why I invited Carolyn to meet with us because I know you've had your plate full with a lot of stuff going on and the planning board is just chugging away in the background. So, um, I wanted you to get a chance to meet everybody. Um, I think I'll start with uh, Dr. Zagrodnik, who is our senior member, who has been on the board since when? Well, 45 years. Uh, certainly, uh, I had dark hair back then. and uh, <laughs> You lost the dark hair three years in. <laughs> That's right. But uh, so uh, I grew up on a farm here in Hadley and certainly the preservation of open space and APR land, agricultural preservation was my primary goal, but certainly I enjoyed being part of the community and helping shape the community. But uh, eventually my full-time job was an orthodontist. I'm now retired now back to being a farmer. So I've gone full circle. Oh. And, but uh, nevertheless, uh, I still enjoy it. I enjoy working with the members on the board, and I hope that I continually can contribute. And next in seniority is our chairman. I, I've been on the board since 1983, so that's, uh, what, 37 years, 30, yeah, 37 years. Um, I'm a degreed engineer by trade, recently, well, three years ago, retired. And just for the record, I mentioned earlier in the meeting that there's four of us that have were or have been associated with farming. That would be Joe, myself, and Mike. Michael and myself, our parents and grandparents had farms. We worked on a farm as little kids. Bill Dwyer, his father, and well, now he still 
owns farmland in Hadley that is co- that is contracted out to various. I think it was potato farm now, wasn't it, Bill? Right. Well, my grandparents and great grandparents were farmers. Okay, and so there's Mark is the only one that really hasn't been directly involved in farming, but not he, true. Well, Mark, not true. I grew up. Uh, I earned my. F- first income in Jersey working on hay farms and I own corn and soy farms in Illinois, but I'm not a Hadley farmer. No, I don't yeah, qualify. Yeah, probably the, the, the caveat there is with the four of us, with the exception of Mark, we're all Hadley farmers. There you go. Mark, Mark is a farmer, but in a different area. So <laughs> you have five farmers in one way or another on this board. And obviously we push for the continuation of farming, we support farmers wherever we can, however we can. And um, like I said, I'm semi-retired. I now work basically part-time as a delivery driver. And that's about it. So I'm third in seniority and I've been on since I think 85 or 86. Yeah, when I tell people I'm third in seniority on a five-member board with only 35 years in, um, that gets people's attention. (laughs) Um, I uh, I went to school in Hadley. I am a lawyer. My office is in Hadley. And um, I'm the daytime contact for the planning board because I work for myself and um, I can take calls during business hours. We, We have no staff. So um, it's good to have some contact so someone can figure out how to, um, how to get a question answered. Then uh, Mike is our, one of the two newbies. I think you have about seven years in now. I think so. I think I'm approaching seven. I, uh, I got involved in, in town government in 1997 when uh, Linda Sanderson, Bill's wife, called me and asked me if I would run for uh, commissioner on the Hampshire County. Uh, they needed somebody to represent Hadley in that position. And I ran and I was the last commissioner because Hampshire County ended and it morphed into the Hampshire Council of Governments. And for years, I was the uh, counselor on the Hampshire Council of Governments, which I left, uh, I don't know, three years ago, I saw the writing on the wall and I don't want to be part of it and it blew up. But while that was going on, I, I, I assumed uh, John Devine's position who passed away. He was on the board for how many years, Bill? A, a long time. Well, he was, he was uh, third in seniority. And the only reason I got to be third was that he died in office. Yeah. So I assumed uh, John's position and, and I, uh, I think I ran for re-election once, and I'm coming up for re-election again this year. I, I did grow up on a farm in North Adley. I, had, I was the oldest. I got four younger sisters, uh, and the farm's still there. Uh, it's 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 leased out to uh, a local farmer, and uh, you know I put around in the garden and do what I can do, and uh, and that's about it. It's uh, it's been a pleasure. It's, I'm kind of the honorary member of the board but I'm trying to calm that down, you know, but uh, we, we had some significant things that have happened since I've been on here. We, uh, one of the most significant is we stopped uh, five colleges Inc from putting a 60 or 70,000 square foot monstrosity in a, in a, uh, in a uh, residential neighborhood off of Rocky Hill road and, and, uh, and uh, North Maple street. And uh, they, they claimed Dover Mem- amendment, uh, exemption too, but that, that didn't work. So uh, you, you've heard a lot about the Dover Amendment and uh, we, 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 we stood up to them and uh, we, we beat them back and we maintained a great, great neighborhood in that part of town, that's all. And then we want to mention from a financial point of view, uh, in fact, Wharton and your business background. So Mike kind of gives us our financial advice and uh, wherever it's needed. Yeah, I went to Wharton when uh, you still had, you know, the uh, cards you had to put in the computer. (laughs) (laughs) Punch cards, punch cards. And then uh, Mark Dunn is our newest member. Uh, Was elected two years ago. I'm in my, I'm, what am I, halfway through my second year, I guess. 
So I, um, that's my entree into municipal government. And I've been, uh, I feel a little bit like uh, Rebecca speaking earlier that, uh, oops, I didn't know that. Oops, I didn't know that. So uh, <laughs> I've been trying to learn on the go. Joe's been, Joe and Mike have been good about taking me on, under their wing and uh, advising me and asking questions and answering questions. Um, I come here from, uh, uh, for the last 13 years, I've been a uh, staff architect at UMass. And before that, I was in the private sector uh, licensed back in 1990. Um, I grew up in New Jersey where I worked on, on hay farms and uh, before I go to college. And as I said, I, as you can see behind me, that's the, uh, the, uh, farmer that that's the uh, combine with the soy head on it uh, when I was out in, at my farm last year so um, so I have an appreciation for at least corn and soy but uh, farmland and agriculture and I appreciate that we have the APR here and uh, I appreciate the good work that these uh, scholars have been doing on the board so we welcome you to our municipal family so we you've probably noticed that hadley is laid out with a commercial strip through the middle but you go half a mile to a mile north or south and you are into green farmland Mm -hmm. And that is very intentional. You go back to the um, original, the first zoning map that was adopted around 1962 and compare it to today's zoning map. And they are virtually the same. Uh, that, that's been the plan for quite a while. And it took a while to bring it to fruition. And in these times, we don't know whether we're going to need a uh, well, there still seems to be a need for brick and mortar uh, retail and uh, restaurants. Um, so um, it, it seems to, it was a, a good plan from the start, seems to still be a good plan. We're always looking for ways to tweak it. Um, tonight, Ken is here because we have a couple of zoning articles coming up for the, the uh, special town meeting. And uh, we're trying to fine tune some wording on those. And then we'll get started on um, new articles, new things that are coming down. The, uh, there's a uh, new rivers, um, new uh, proposed bylaw from the state of, about uh, uh, residential and business uses in the um, floodway and the flood zone mm -hmm. uh, that we'll be working on for Springtown meeting. So, um, we, we do try to keep on top of trends and um, be responsive to what's going on. Um, not, we try to be more than just a reaction board. Um, I like that. We were just granted, we just received a grant for, our, we don't know how much money from the state for something. Do you know anything about that, Ken or Carolyn? We were one of like half a dozen towns in Western Mass. Was this, um... Mm, I don't know. <laughs> I know that I helped um, David Nixon apply for a grant. I don't know if that's the one that was specific to. It, it was, it was, I forgot where it was. It was just in a newspaper. I think Monday night I read it or Monday. Okay. The end was, of it the for businesses? was it for support for businesses? Yeah. I think something like that. Yeah. Hmm. I'm not. I mean, we've got, we got to find out more information about it because I'm... There's, yeah, think, there's a couple. So I, I can get that information for you. Okay, because I think the planning board is more or less going to be the the center of that one somehow. And I just, and because I when David applied, he asked that the planning board would uh, be in charge of it. And we agreed to do it. And because it sounded like something that we, you know, was, it was written around the planning board. And I just want to find out what we have to do. Sure. How much is it? Do you know? It didn't say. It just said there was, I think, 100 and, 
I forgot how much money was given out to the half a dozen communities that received it, but didn't say how much Hadley received. Okay. There, there's a couple things that it's sounding like a couple things that it could be, but um, Bill, is it okay if I, uh, or Jim, for me just to introduce, just share my experience and what brought Please me to Hadley? Yeah. Please do. So um, we're talking about farmers. So I don't know if you can actually say Farming is in your DNA, but my dad was a dairy farmer and my grandfather was a dairy farmer. And That's um, to be in your genes. It, so I'm feeling like it's in my genes. I, uh, for anybody who gets my emails at 4 a.m. in the morning, part of that was just growing up with a dad who you got up at five o'clock to do what you needed to do. Um, I was not a farmer, but I spent a lot of time um, visiting my dad as he was a professor of agriculture and economics at UMass. So my roots kind of are in UMass. I went to UMass. Uh, my first job to get myself through school was um, actually about, I don't know, a quarter of a mile from where my office is now at the town hall um, at Shady Lawn Rest Home. That was my major was gerontology. And so I spent my uh, several, well, not several, but I would say two or three years taking the bus from my uh, Puffton village in UMass and um, going to get dropped off at Middle Street and walking down to uh, Shady Lawn Rest Home. And uh, so I spent a lot of time there. And um, But Amherst, I did my first municipal position was, in UMA was at uh, Amherst. So I started municipal government in the late, I guess, 1980s. And um, so I, if any, I, I, Bill may have heard this, if anyone has been involved in any of my, watching my interviews or my introductions was, um, I definitely call myself a municipal junkie. Um, I've worked closely with Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. In fact, one of my hardest things for me to leave East Long Meadow, um, having been my third community I'd worked in, third municipal government I had worked in was working with Ken because a passion for mine is, a, is affordable housing for um, seniors and young adults. And Ken and I had just started working on um, that project that I hope is moving forward in East Long Meadow, a, a need for that. Um, but about, so after, oh, I would say over 30 years working in municipal government, I decided that I wanted to move from a council on aging director position to um, town management or administration. So in 2017, I did, I went and got my MBA. And um, soon after that, I was very fortunate to have um, gotten involved with the Mass Municipal Association and got connected with Denise Baker, who did most of the programming for all of the subcommittees for MMA. And once she found out that that was my desire, um, she, she opened up some really good opportunities for me to learn more about town management. And I uh, attended a program called, uh, I can never get the name straight, but it was, um, it was a certificate. It was a year long program in Andover. And that was about two years ago. And it was uh, for through Suffolk University in the MMA program for the Moakley Center of Public Management. And it was every Friday I drove to Andover from Wilbraham, which is where I live, and an hour and a half there and about three hours home at the end of the day, every Friday for nine months. And I uh, knew, knew I just would never ever live at that end of the state. I don't understand congestion. I don't understand how people live there. I just don't understand. Um, but with it, a month and a half into the program, I found out that the class was gonna be in Northampton. So that was a huge disappointment, but I stuck it out and, um, and just fell in love even more with municipal government and learned more about my management style and learned what towns, I worked in a town in similar in size of Hadley, but not the same. I worked in the town of Hamden for a long time. Um, and you can say that they're very similar in size, but Hadley's very different. And so um, as I pursued uh, this position, um, I kind of got, I stopped the Hadley, uh, your, your page, and I looked at your master plan, your open space, David Nixon's amazing documents on the state of Hadley, his, um, his service directory, his service plan, and also the master plan. And I really used that a lot as I went through the interview process because 
What I loved about it was the agricultural aspect of Hadley, as well as the challenges you have of economic development. How do, how do those two match? And so I love challenges like that. And um, so I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm, it's been a whirlwind of the, I think it's what it's maybe six or seven weeks now. Um, I feel like I have a lot of drawers open that haven't gotten shut yet and trying to master, you know, and learn everything. Um, but just tonight sitting in on the meeting, and this is what I try to explain to people, working with the, with the employees in the town hall, every decision they make is not a, I, I, I you know, it's, some people say that's not true, but I swear every decision they make is based on the benefit of the Hadley resident. And that has so impressed me. And then sitting in on this meeting and just seeing how you listen to the challenges that she had um, with her business and the challenges that face farmers and how you guys responded to that just reinforces my commitment that I, that I just really have enjoyed watching that and um, how much engagement there is of the stakeholders from your committees and the stakeholders from your employees um, on how much they care about the residents. And it, it just seems like everything that they do, um, that's their focus. It's not very self-centered. So that has been a really, uh, a really nice thing to be a part of. Um, so I have been, I am presently a select board member in my community in Wolverham. And I've been on FinCom. I was on FinCom for about five or six years and chaired FinCom. Presently, the, the, I sit on the Association of Town Finance Committees because they, they're letting me stay till the end of the year. They didn't kick me off. And um, I'm on the executive board for MMA. So I'm just giving you a profile that I really do love municipal government. And I am just really pleased to, uh, to actually have Hadley be my first role as a town administrator because everyone has just been really, really supportive. Um, and I just, I was so happy when I saw that Ken was so engaged with Hadley. So, cause I, I, we, we had just started working together and, um, so I'm, that's great. And I just, I, I had my favorite projects, whether it was building a senior center or renovating a senior center or other master plans being involved with that. I have been very involved with Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, very dependent on them for their expertise. And I understand the value of that. So Again, just really glad to see Ken pop up here. So that was like Ken too. <laughs> so. Well, look more. Thank you. We and had a have had a very long standing relationship with Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. As you may know, Tim Brennan, who passed away a couple of years ago, was chair for was the uh, executive director for a long time. He lived in Hadley. Oh, I didn't know that. And um, I was actually pre I was actually chairman of the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission for six years. Oh, uh, so you Jim Masick as well, who retired. Jim Masick was a yep. Worked closely yep. with Jim. When I was a, when I my daughters were young and I was a soft. My wife and I were softball coaches. Tim's daughter was on our softball team. Oh, nice. I'm not related. Tim and I aren't related. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Welcome aboard. Thank you. We, we, we will be working together as a, with the board and you um, a lot, as you will see. And Definitely. Is, and I do want to mention be, before you close, Jim, if we can talk a little bit about the, um, uh, the FEMA flood insurance maps. I don't know um, if you guys have been aware of that, that directive. Oh, well, depending what, 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 we might be, I'm not sure what you're talking about, but you can talk about it right now. Okay, so FEMA, um, we, the town's been put on notice that um, FEMA is amending the zoning and general bylaws to comply with the federal rec requirements, they're requiring that of, of the town of Hadley. Um, and so that's a real, it's a, it's a long process uh, and it needs to be on the agenda for the annual town meeting. So it's gonna definitely be totally dependent on the working with the planning board to um, see what that looks like. Um, Ken, I don't know if you're familiar with that or not. Um, yeah, so um, I attended a, um, a uh, workshop of the, the model bylaw that um, the folks at the, the mass uh, floodplain manager um, put on with regards to that model bylaw. And, um, you know, I'm starting to navigate it. Um, I think that there may be a staff person that is probably more um, aware of some of the nuance of floodplain insurance and management than I am. Um, however, 
um, between the both of us, we can um, help amend um, the, the zoning bylaw because that's where your, your regulations um, are. Um, yeah, it was shared that, you know, it, it's, it's better to um, pass these sooner rather than later, knowing that the um, flood insurance rate maps are going to be updated within the next two years. Um, I think it was 2022 or 2023, at least for the Pioneer Valley. Um, so it is a conversation that I'm having with other communities that are amending their bylaws at the same time. Um, so, um, and it sounds as if Bill, you know, is aware of that. So I think that, that, that was the one I was referencing. Yeah. Um, that well, we, that Catherine will be. Or, or Ken, uh, Jim and I, two years ago, went to the presentation at the Jones Library in Amherst when they were going to change the, uh, the floodplain dimensions. And uh, they said it was two years from then. So you're talking two more years. But, as far uh, as the, the flood rate maps, um, my understanding was that because your bylaw has to also address some additional um, regulations that are not covered in what is currently in your bylaw, in addition to references to the new maps that will be forthcoming. Um, so I think either way, you would have had to amend the bylaw to reflect the new maps. But on top of that, you'll have to amend the bylaw to reflect some new regulation. But there was supposed to be an open agenda because the, uh, the expansion of the flood zones were considerable. And uh, I look at it as a, as a way as the federal government obviously needs more financial help to support their FEMA projects because they're running out of money. And uh, it was quite dramatically increased in certain areas. So if Carolyn or Ken gets the map, bring it to our attention right away so we can, because there's then there's a hearing, uh, traditionally there's a hearing where you can argue this is floodplain, right. and yes it is, and because they'll, they just do it from uh, 30,000 feet. Yeah, and you're right. You know, there there are mechanisms to ensure that that map reflects what's on the ground. Um, and obviously, the planning board knows what's on the ground. And, um, you know, in my experience as a floodplain manager, when I was a, a municipal planner in Florida, um, that was the case where, you know, there were some instances where developers would come and say, we want to develop here. But we're in the flood zone and the federal government is saying that we have to file a change of flood map. Um, it didn't really require anything other than the notification to the town that that was the case. Uh, and there were some public hearings that had to happen. Um, and then, you know, they would have to get, get their approvals from the planning board for the, the subdivision. But um, there, there are mechanisms. And so I, I'm not sure as far as the the comment period for addressing a draft map i'm not really sure how that works other than knowing that there's always a mechanism to address whatever the official map is now in in the past there hasn't been many sanctions against the town you know traditionally when it was originally passed we had to be aware that if we did not pass the uh the FEMA map that we would not be eligible for federal flood insurance, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, you could not get a loan from any federally insured lending institution. And number three, any uh, aid, whether it be federal for sewer or clean waters or something like that, the town would not be eligible. So they kind of beat you over the head with those three rules. If, if you didn't accept it, you were out. But, uh, but if you don't comply now, I have never seen a town uh, that has been, uh, had their FEMA insurance taken away from them. But it probably would come in a critical time in it if there were a flood and all of a sudden you did not comply, then they wouldn't give you federal aid. So, well, this is digressing a little bit, but. Uh, 
Yeah, we'll have to wait. Obviously, and see. we've got work to do. Once we get more information, we'll have to yes. be, do something with it. Yeah. And certainly the trailer issue is big on everybody's mind. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I just wanted to give you a heads up that probably getting that on a calendar um, cause it looked, it, it looked complicated to me, Ken. <laughs> so I think that the earlier it starts, the better. And there is a placeholder right now on the annual town meeting in May. Um, so we, at least, so it's, it's on that target. Okay. Thank you. We'll probably get started on that. Uh, well, right after, uh, right after the special town meeting. Thank yeah, you. <laughs> Not before. <laughs> yeah. We don't want to put the cart before the course either because if we don't get the new updated uh, FEMA map, uh, yet they're asking us to comply with the regulations. Uh, if my land is not in or is it in, uh, it, it means a lot to the people. Mm -hmm. So go ahead, Ken. You, yeah, I mean, I, I do think that, you know, there probably is a little more um, research that we'll need to do with regards to the, the model. Um, knowing that what I've heard from the floodplain um, person at the state is that maps are being updated. I know there was a study done of um, communities along the Connecticut River. Um, so they're doing their background work to determine those new maps with regards to this model bylaw and the adoption of it. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think to, to Carolyn's point, um, it is a reflection of some additional regulations, even so with your current map, current maps. So, you know, it would, that's not to say that in 2022, you may have to adopt a, or you may have to amend the zoning bylaw to reflect the new firm maps that would be coming out of FEMA. Um, so this is a separate thing with regards to new regulation that addresses the current floodplain map. We'll have to wait and see. Yeah. Town meeting, <clears throat> back to the town meeting warrant for Saturday. Um, information, we got there is a Zoom, it's a Zoom public hearing, Zoom hearing tomorrow, um, Carolyn, about the uh, review of the warrant. Yes, there is. Okay. And that starts at, do you know, 7 o'clock, 630? Uh, I have to look, I can look on board docs. We do have executive session early. Um, I, I'd have to look at the time. I can do that now, though, while you're. Okay. The uh, one item that we've been, with the definitions are pretty well set. I have had contact with several people about um, using a formula to get a fee. And after thinking about it, I think what we should do as a planning board is set a fee based on best available information maybe for the year. And also, let me, let me explain that. So when on maybe the first of the year, we would set a fee if somebody came in with an affordable set of units and say, if you want to donate to the town, this is how much money you'll need to donate for each unit. If you can prove that the fee is too high, and you want to come up with your own fee, here's the formula. And it needs to be documented that how you came up with it. If, if you think our fee is too high, because they can always have the option of doing the units <clears throat> on their own. Let me explain why I say this. I talked to the Massachusetts uh, Western Mass Builders Association and two different contractors. And they said that coming up with a wholesale price is very difficult. They both used what I thought was a pretty high price for, an for a wholesale price. They, 
the, music, the Mass Municipal Association doesn't do anything like that. But I did speak to two contractors and they both came up with a rough price of $200 a square foot for the building, which to me seemed quite high, plus the price of the land, plus the mortgage. When you, come, when you use those numbers, you come up that they're going to be donating something in the order of $130,000 or $140,000 to the fund for each unit that they need to determine to be affordable. And while, you know, it's going to be nice to build, build, the, build up a fund like that, that just seems to be a very high number. And so if I didn't confuse you, what does the board think about that? I mean, so, we have to come up with something fairly simple that the town will understand and accept. Certainly the developer still has the option of putting up the unit by himself. But if he wants to donate to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, that would be the formula. And we have to start somewhere. And that seems fairly easy to understand. But certainly you, you may think it's a lot of money, but if the town gets into the construction of doing affordable units, it comes under the prevailing wage. Well, no, 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 I'm not. I'm not talking the town getting into the building. Of okay. Yeah. I'm just talking about we would set a fee. Correct. A fee that you would donate. If you can prove that you can do it for a lot less, and I do mean prove it by documenting everything, mm -hmm. then we may accept your numbers. So we'd give them essentially three choices, a set fee, a fee they could calculate, or they could own the building and do the rentals themselves or the wholesales, wholesaling of the, of the building and be responsible for the affordable units directly. But the, that part would actually be in our regulations. I think that's a good approach. Yeah, I, I think that works with what I talked about last time, which was as, as an alternative to the cost to the town the developers demonstrated wholesale cost of construction. But some of the model language, some of the sample language I sent around from other towns did have flat fees in it. Yeah. So um, I'll take, I'll, I'll try to work, I'll try to work through that and see if I can come up with some language that we can use for an amendment. Okay. So are we in agreement that we would give the, the developer, we would have a flat fee set, but we would have to re have to revise that maybe every year or two. Mm -hmm. Or they could come up with a calculated fee from the formula based on what the one that Mike is. I mean, even our fee that we come up with is going to be kind of based on Mike's formula. I just, yes, I like that. But I, th I think the wording needs to give us some teeth so that they just can't come in and say it's going to cost $150 and and we had to take it. That, that's why it's going to be documented. That's right. Yeah. yeah. That's why I want to use demonstrated. Okay. No, whatever. You, yeah. We're yeah. on the same page with the, with the wording. Yeah. Whatever fancy word we want to use. Yeah. Go to it, Bill. Okay. Okay. So I'll run through the, uh, I'm sure there's some language. I think I ended up with about 15 different formulas from different towns, but um, I think I can find something that yeah. is reasonably comfortable. And, and that that formula and the wording doesn't have to be on the warrant. All we've got to do is reference that in the uh, regulations. We just need to use the right words in the amendment that say something to the effect of that. Is that right, Ken? Um, I believe so. I mean, the the... The way that we had um, at least proposed the um, um, amendment was to reflect what would be your calculation that you would actually um, update from time to time in the, in the rules and regulations. So 
the bylaw language was um, pretty generic um, with regards to that. I think that you can still do that um, in the rules and regs. I guess maybe just some finesse of refinement of what, and I'll have to, you know, um, dust off what what we I think had at least brought to the town um, council um, for for the town meeting, but it's okay to have a calculation and base your calculations on how you determine those numbers in the rules and regs. Okay. Because it'll just, be changed from time to time. Yeah, we so, just wanted to tie the bylaw into some sort of an ascertainable standard. And then we would deal with how we implemented that through the rules right. and regs. I believe that's correct. Yes. Yeah. We make sure it doesn't, we don't use the word, make sure we're not ref inferring a prevailing wage in the actual bylaw itself. Okay. We can't, we won't really be able to discuss it as a board, um, but <clears throat> I'll try to send out anything I can come up with and uh, we can, we can discuss it at town meeting. Right. And to be honest, I mean, even if we had to table this article again, it's not the end of the world because we have, I mean, nobody's going to be building subdivisions or anything like that probably before May. Mm -hmm. So um, if it gets too complicated and we had to table it, it wouldn't be terrible. And I'm sure that the uh, select board wouldn't mind one less article to deal with because now we're going to be outside, I think, more than inside because of, uh, well, Carolyn, do you know how Governor Baker's orders are going to impact us? So the municipal government is typically not, does not fall in the same line as uh, the public. So I think the way we have it set up is, is going to work fine. Okay. All right. Well, that's good to know. So it's, it's at the, uh, it's at the, for the firehouse now is that the yes part of it will be outside as much as we can but for those that are older adults or those that need to be inside there, there's going to be enough room i think for people I, I mean i have not been at a hadley town annual town meeting or special town meeting but i think under the circle well, america is moving from state to state they're moving to florida do over i don't think you're going to so it does tell you something about where we're going and i think if you're a republican or Wait, Trump, what you're doing something, whatever you got okay whatever. so carolyn to put it in perspective um what we're talking about is an amendment to the inclusionary zoning bylaw mm -hmm. to allow people to buy out of actually building an, a, an affordable unit in a subdivision. In the years since we've adopted that bylaw, the inclusionary zoning, which is probably about seven or eight years now, we've only had one subdivision that's been affected by it. And one senior housing project that's been affected by it. So that's why when we talk about tabling it, we're not- Sure. It, it's it's not a um, it's not a blazing emergency. It's something that is a, that is a relatively rare situation, but probably something we'll be seeing more of going forward. Mm -hmm. Do you see a lot of discussion over it? No, these typically the zoning articles lately have been pretty straightforward. They're on the we're typically on the warrant last, and they're not. Lately, we haven't had any controversial things. We also try to avoid making any serious amendment to a zoning article on town meeting floor because they usually are pretty complex. And if somebody just hears the words, obviously what you say and what they hear sometimes can be quite different. Oh yeah. So when it's in writing, it's in writing. Mm -hmm. um, when it's said, sometimes it can be misconstrued so we really like to avoid amending those, like I said, on a floor. 
And this may be a, might be a bit complex to amend. Um, and people, if they don't understand it, can really get into some serious discussion. So that's why I said we may end up, we may consider tabling it depending how, how complex. Yeah, and I would agree. I know that that's the desire um, of the town to keep that meeting as short as possible. Yeah. So luckily, it's supposed to be a warm day. Is Carol, it? It's supposed Carol, to be by way of uh, information, Hadley has thirteen percent of its housing, which is the highest in the Happy Valley here, as a designated affordable by the state. Mm -hmm. So we're higher than Amherst or Northampton or any yeah. of our surrounding communities by far. Yeah, and I want to like when I when I had mentioned and and Ken will understand when I said affordable housing as well. Um, my concern is actually it's more that uh, just as a point of reference from my perspective, not that it really matters, but just so you know, I, I have a concern for the shortage of housing for seniors that aren't in, don't fit subsidized housing but can't afford a three hundred fifty thousand uh, dollar. Uh, condo and then for the young adult who can't afford to buy a home doesn't want to buy a home but wants to stay in the community but there's no place for them so rentals of you know that they can afford so i don't really know if that matters but just so you well, know my it, it does and, and the problem is there have been a few people in town that have, we don't have obviously hadley doesn't allow apartments right people have been some some people have been pushing to have hadley allow apartments and I said this a couple of years ago at a meeting that I talked to several developers. They would love to build apartments in Hadley because there is a need and they could get top dollar for them. Oh, good, yeah. So what would happen if we allowed apartments is we're just going to have expensive housing, but more of it. Mm -hmm. So it's not really going to address the issue of what people would like. They think if we get apartments, we're gonna have affordable units. I mean, unless you push them to do that and we don't have that authority, mm -hmm. um, they're gonna be market rate and that's gonna be quite expensive. Right. And well, one of the things know? that this affordable, held, this affordable housing trust fund, once it gets some money in it, we now have some dollars behind us to push to get some reasonable priced housing in. How will that all work? That remains to be seen. We don't have those answers right now, but it's possible. I'll leave it at that. Hey, Ken, question for you. Is there a place I can go to or a website to find out what um, is considered affordable housing in our area? Um, or could you look, could you look, could you try to find something, get it to me? Are you looking for like, what is, um, what would be considered affordable, like for a, a family of four? I mean, what, what I mean is this, this, this affordable units that we're talking about, it's, I don't want to call it subsidized, but they're for, based on the moderate income definition that's in the state there is a limit on what they would be, what they could pay for housing, be it rental or mortgage. And I would like to find, go to a place as opposed to always asking, I'm assuming that somebody's gonna have that on a website, yeah, based on a family of two, family of four, whatever it might be, that we could find out to use that in our formula. I think that there is a, a, a definition that HUD uses, and I'll have to um, look at this, but housing, affordable housing is supposed to be 30% of an annual income. And if you're within the 80% of the annual median income for the metropolitan area, which in this case is Springfield, for a family of four, 80% of AMI is I think 68,000. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I, that's just, um, I, I don't know. And I would have to do some research with regards to where we could find something. Well, even easily. that formula, even that formula you gave me is a helpful. So it's 30% of the, 
of 80% of the annual the, the the of the annual average income annual median income that annual is median. those are the terms that um, um, the department of housing and urban development um, when it comes to allocating you know housing um, okay but that that's usually the and I think in, in affordable housing circles, and I, I know definitely for when we are doing master plans and talking about housing, um, we utilize the 30% of um, at least, and I, I think that's in, in um, regulatory language, but at, you know, I think with housing advocates too, um, there is this discussion that people shouldn't be paying more than 30% of their annual income towards housing. And that would be considered affordable. Well, by way of information for Carolyn, we say we do not have apartments per se, but if you drive around town and you see seven or eight automobiles parked outside of a house, those are student stuffers, I call them. And I know, I know there are uh, three houses that are gonna be proposed in Hadley purposely for rentals. And so those are going to be $800 or to 850 a bedroom. That's on the cheap side. And the new ones in uh, are 1200 a bedroom in uh, North Amherst, it's in the Joneses. So, so it's man, are you saying then that the determination of how much one could spend for affordable housing in Hadley is going to be based on what the average income is in Springfield. That is correct. That's insane. We are, we are insane. in that area, and that is the way the, the government figures that out, Mike. Yeah, it's just it's it makes no sense at all from reality, Mike. So, it, it's so, it's a political discussion. I have sure. A, well, we just have to point these inconsistencies out so people understand that it has. No bearing at all to re what the reality is. You're absolutely Look, correct. Weston is included in the Boston area. When so we do zone. have some definitions in the inclusionary zoning bylaw, uh, section 25 of the bylaw. Well, I think those, uh, Ken, are what you were referring to. Um, but whether that, um, it, it looks like we're we're talking about uh, thirty percent of. Uh, Gross household income of households added below 80% of the area median income. Yep. So that, that's a definition we already have in uh, the inclusionary zoning bylaw. So, I, yeah, I think to Jim's point, it's a place where what I guess what an average. Yeah, I don't know. I get there's I think there's some nuance in trying to determine that. Um, knowing that we've we've defined e in your bylaw and elsewhere that it's affordable is um, as 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 Bill was um, you know saying that definition is the thirty percent of the eighty percent of the annual median income, um, but what does that actually mean? Um, mm -hmm. So I think yeah, I I will do some research and and ask around. Um, that's that's good for me to know too. All right, I think we beat this with to death enough, Jim, and yeah. I concur, put it in the rules and regs if we have to. Yeah. Okay. I have nothing else. Oh, wait, I, do, I take that back. I do, I have two invoices to pay. We have an invoice from Pioneer Valley Planning Commission for services from 7-1 through 9-30, and the amount is $1,170.70. Motion to pay that. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. We also have a invoice from the Daily Hampshire Gazette for $279.10 for the legal notice for the Balloonis accessory apartment that is coming up at our next meeting in two weeks. Motion to pay. Second. Any other discussion? 
All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Okay, that takes care of bills. Good. I have nothing else. I will plan on um, being at uh, the select board meeting tomorrow night to talk about these. As a service to those people that are watching out there on. Well, they're having their, they're including the forum on the town meeting within the select board meeting. Right. I just, uh, on that note, can we, as a, as we close our meeting, if anyone's watching this, can we tell them what time on Saturday the special town oh, meeting right. is? Good point. I, I can't find that on the website. The meeting starts at one o'clock on Saturday, Carolyn? Yes, it does. One o'clock. One o'clock at the public safety complex on East Street. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I hope to attend for our night's meeting too with the select board. And that I think is at six o'clock according to the town website. Okay. All right, anything else? Thank you for joining us, Carolyn. Yeah, that was great. Thank, Thank you. you. And Ken, it was good to see you. Keep see smiling. You. <laughs> I will. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Meeting is history. Thank you. And thank you, John. <laughs> <laughs>